everybody, it's an incredible honor and pleasure to have Peter Sterling here with us to launch uh, right into July 2023 edition of Living Histories. Peter has such a rich and varied um, set of stories he could possibly tell us. I can't wait to hear which ones he chooses to tell us today. Please take it away, Peter. Thank you, Srividya, for inviting me to tell my story. I was born in 1940, and I just turned 83, so perhaps you're just in time. My career uh, in neuroscience was reasonably successful, um, and I'll summarize what it entailed, and then I will comment on some difficulties I encountered and how I managed them. So my parents were writers and social activists. They met on the Federal Writers Project, in the 1930s, and later, my mother worked on Life Magazine, dad at CBS Radio, and they supported unions and opposed racial segregation and lynchings. And they also wrote books on nature and struggles for social justice. The vehicle for their work uh, was uh, membership in the uh, Communist Party for a long time. And so it was natural for me and my sister, uh, Professor Ann Fausto Sterling, as red diaper babies to follow suit. This was my first scientific report at Cornell University. Um, and uh, upon submitting it, I left Ithaca uh, for Mississippi to join the Freedom Rides, which, whose goal was to fill the jails uh, in Mississippi to embarrass President uh, Kennedy into ending racial segregation. So this was my mugshot. And my concern for social justice persisted and in the mid-1960s, I was in Cleveland, Ohio, a graduate student studying motor pathways from the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord and brain stem. I would slip away from my microscope to canvas door to door in Central, the poorest black ghetto. And people answering my knock were often partially paralyzed. They were limping, sagging face, slurred speech. And back in lab, I learned that the proximate cause was destruction of these very pathways by stroke from chronic hypertension. So I recall that when my granddad lived in Central, it had been a Jewish ghetto, and uh, he'd been segregated, and he too had suffered hypertension and early stroke. So maybe I thought hypertension is caused by social tension. So my laboratory studies identified neural pathways that were damaged by stroke, and my street studies suggested a cause, social injustice. So sensing this uh, connection, I was thrilled. On the other hand, I was often conflicted. Should I be in the lab or in the street? So fast forward to my own laboratory at UPenn, where I studied fine scale uh, circuitry. I was still slipping away but now to the library, seeking evidence for the causes of hypertension. I was also devouring ethnographic studies to learn how other people live. And soon I was slipping away to, to visit indigenous communities in Central America. And uh, now I live half the year in, in the mountains of Western Panama in a community of subsistence farmers and agricultural workers. So here's what I learned about hypertension. I learned that the blood pressures of foragers and horticulturalists, such as these people, are low and steady with age. Uh, for example, this Nobe family waving to us lives on Panama's Caribbean slope, two days walk from the nearest market. This is the same is true for similar groups in Southeast Asia and South America and Africa. But in the US, blood pressures rise as children enter school. Uh, and by graduation, 25% reach the hypertension range. And this reflects sustained physiological arousal. <clears throat> the rise is steepest for African-Americans who are the most stressed because in the US, black lives still don't matter. So I also studied how the brain drives hypertension by reading widely in neuroscience and connecting the dots. Um, so the, it, it turns out that the brain predicts the upcoming needs to raise the pressure and it controls all relevant mechanisms. So here is one line, the brain controls the kidney uh, to uh, save salt water to use it uh, to increase plasma volume. The brain can increase the heart rate and, and strength in the two of these can determine cardiac, raise cardiac output. And the brain can also constrict 
uh, all the arterial vessels to raise resistance. And these factors all go together to raise pressure. Now, um, the brain also controls, by the way, our appetite for salt. And so when we need uh, to raise pressure over a period of time, we prefer salty foods. Um, so the uh, uh, drugs uh, can, can block each mechanism, uh, but the brain then predicting the need uh, compensates. So here you can give a diuretic to encourage the kidney to shed salt water, but the brain increases the heart rate. And you can block that with a beta blocker, but the brain increases the vascular resistance. And you can block that too. And eventually, uh, drugs can control the pressure. But now the system cannot respond to new predictions. And the other problem is that all of these drugs have various effects on other, other uh, points. And so the beta blocker, for example, increases blood glucose and it exacerbates type 2 diabetes, which is already a contributor to the hypertension. And you can treat those with more drugs, and what you end up with is an is a ill patient who's precariously stabilized by polypharmacy. So um, this, this all led me to write a book uh, a couple of years ago, which explains from the bottom up, from thermal noise uh, up through our brain to what our species needs for a healthy, healthy life. And this reflects uh, an interplay between my lab studies and my, and my social activism. And I'm still writing on the social and psychological causes of disease. And all of the articles are available at this, uh, at this link. So now, uh, now some difficulties. For all of my advantages, uh, my life over multiple long stretches has been hard. Uh, in the streets, am I brave enough? In graduate school, am I smart enough? Uh, starting my lab, I was paralyzed with self-doubt and fear of failure and constant anxiety. As my lab began to succeed, my 20-year marriage imploded. Uh, and the primary chaos, including an intense affair with cannabis, spanned about four years. And just that happened just as my children were, two children were entering adolescence. And they suffered from my chaos as I suffered from my own parents' chaos. So there's actually nothing here to be proud of. Uh, on the other hand, there's no shame either because as I discovered, I'm nothing special. We all suffer, we misbehave, we lose our way. And I lost in midlife, I, I had to learn to manage. And so I found my way to various forms of, of what I call sacred practice. These involved uh, matters really of the soul. And they go well beyond organized religion. And, um, but they always included, for me, uh, um, uh, acknowledging my, my, uh, my wrongs of others and, and seeking forgiveness from those who I had wronged, and in turn, forgiving others for their trespasses against me. So here are a couple of readings that I helped me find my way. And they all actually contain core lessons for young people for lab management. Uh, there were stories of human frailty in Genesis, uh, the life cycle of Buddha in Siddhartha, uh, some truths from the universe in, in the Tao Te Ching, uh, the need for practice in Zen and the art of archery, uh, and some paths to courage uh, in the Book of Five Rings. I also uh, had periods during my life where I sought psychotherapy. Uh, first, when I was building my lab in my early 30s, I was also a member of a men's group for 13 years. We met weekly to discuss our, our issues in a, very, in a very deep and open way and support each other. Uh, I, needed, I went back again uh, at the beginning of my second marriage uh, and at the death of my father when I was 49. And finally, when I was 60, to try to finally understand my mother and our relationship. And so I would like to close with one example of how I managed. I needed to manage my anxiety at a Society for Neuroscience among 30 to 40,000 attendees. Would I be noticed? Will my studies measure up? Will my students succeed? Who should I attend to? And I learned to arrive the evening before and go straight to my room and order a burger. Then I would open the Bible um, to Ecclesiastes and I would read. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, 
vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit have a man uh, of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? One generation patheth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth, the earth abides. The sun also writheth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he lives. The wind goeth north and south, and turneth about, and it whirleth about continuously, and returneth again to uh, to his, his point. And the next morning, with that mantra, all is vanity, I would walk calmly into the meeting, and I would enjoy it. Thank you. Oh. Wow. Um, thank you so much, Peter. There was so much in that talk that was radical. Um, I'm hard pressed to choose a selection of questions to ask. So, so let me first start by asking you um, about sacred practice, which you highlighted in the context of something you discuss in greater detail in one of your essays uh, in the context of music. Um, through the example of music, would you please walk us through exactly how you imagine sacred practice can keep us together through all the stresses that we have in these different environments? Well, briefly, uh, you know, music humans and humans goes way, way back. Uh, there's a there's a, a bone flute from Germany from 40,000 years ago. So that's pretty early uh, in our existence. There is uh, There are paintings, cave paintings from 45,000 years ago. And so art and, and music, uh, which included dance um, and, uh, and singing were things that early humans did basically to, uh, to bind themselves together so that they wouldn't be lonely because we're a very, very social species. And we need uh, not just a nuclear family, we need multiple generations. That's how we actually uh, evolved for 200,000 years. And so uh, now it's very easy to lose these social aspects uh, because we, we we do all the little things on our on our cell phones and, and in isolation. And I think that's driving a lot of uh, of a modern modern problems. So um, so uh, I I actually did rediscover my my Jewish roots, which I had not been raised to because I was a communist. But I, I did return, uh, and uh, I'm an atheist, but I but I definitely uh, get something out of the communal celebration of of the rituals several you know several times a year. I fast. I uh, during the period of atonement, and I try to atone, you know. And the first time I did it when I was in my forties, it was a just an overwhelming experience because I'd never done it before. I had forty years of of bad things really to atone for, and now you know I only have a year each year, and uh, it's it, it becomes easier. Wow. Um... A question from the audience. Um, while uh, the correlate, while they appreciate the correlation between stress and high blood pressure, would you, in a few seconds, comment on underlying mechanisms? Oh, you know, these are so well known. Uh, they're they're very rich series of mechanisms, and I I don't really want to take the time. You you can go to my book is on it. I published a number of papers on it, and I think it's better to really actually go and and there are many many mechanisms, and they're all driven by the brain. Thank you. Um, so I want to close with a question about the fluidity of boundaries between very many different spaces you described, whether the lab and the outside or, um, or, or the academic and the whole person. Um, there, there was a recurring theme of, I think, being an integrated whole person mm -hmm. without really being force fit into different pigeonholes in different contexts. This is very antithetical to how elite academia is set up in my experience. So would you especially address for early career people how to navigate academia while being a whole person? Um, 
Well, I think what I was trying to express is that it's quite hard. You know, it's it's very demanding. Um, and uh, I mean, I went, I did my postdoc at Harvard in neurobiology when it was just founded and had Nobel Prize winners in it and uh, or to be Nobel Prize winners. And everybody thought they thought they knew how to do neuroscience. And it really didn't fit my personality and or my skills. And so when I started my own lab, I had to find my own way. And that was very frightening because uh, I had been told, you know, this is the way we do it. And uh, so that took me some psychotherapy and some thinking and some suffering, you know, to uh, to work out my own way. And then, uh, of course, my political views and my combining the social activism with neurobiology was <clears throat> it wasn't popular. I mean, uh, the idea of stress in the 1970s was very uh, way out there. And it's much more accepted now because there's a huge amount of evidence. But uh, no, it, you know, it, it takes, <clears throat> it does demand a certain amount of courage and persistence and, uh, and to find support where I could to, to do it, you know. And, and to be honest, there were long periods when I didn't do very much social activism. Uh, I published my first paper in 19... 88 on on allostasis giving it a name and i didn't go back to it for until 2004 and so i sort of walked away from it and it did my work on the retina for that period so you know there's different time periods uh i guess that's another message to young people uh uh a career if you're going for a 40 year career it has different phases and natural things that you want to concentrate on at different times. So uh, you have to figure that out. Thank you so much, Peter. In the interest of time, I'm closing the recording, but on behalf of the audience, many, many thanks. Sure. <laughs>